So this chapter on homomorphisms really gives us the opportunity to tie together all of the ideas from this last act of our course on group theory. Because the questions that we've been asking are, how do we take groups and piece them together into larger groups? And conversely, how do I understand how to break apart a group into smaller pieces so that I can better understand its structure? And it turns out homomorphisms give us the tools to do all of those things. And this example that we did in class today sort of shows how. So here's an example. I've got the dihedral group of the square, d4. And I've got the cyclic group of order 8, z8, integers with addition mod 8. And I'm going to define a function from d4 to z8 by the requirement that I'm going to send the element t from d4, I'm going to send it to the number 4 in z mod 8, and I'm going to send r to 0. And what this means then is if I declare that this is what phi does to these two generators for d4, um, then declaring that phi is a homomorphism means that I will also know how to take, for example, phi of tr cubed. To find that, we'll just use the homomorphism property that says that multiplying t by r by r by r on the inside and the domain of this function is the same as applying phi to each of t, r, r, and r, and then adding the results in the range, so adding them as integers mod 8. But I know what phi of t is, it's 4. I know what phi of r is, it's 0. And so when I compute all this out, I find out that phi of tr cubed is going to be 4. So that same process can be used to figure out where each of the elements, each of the eight elements in d4, gets mapped by this function. So all of e, r, r squared, and r cubed, so every power of that rotation of the square, is getting sent to 0 by this function. And all of the reflections, t, tr, tr squared, tr cubed, those are all getting sent to the number 4 in z mod 8. So this is what this function phi is actually doing to the eight elements of the dihedral group of the square. So what does this tell me about the structure of the dihedral group of the square? So this homomorphism's job, I'm making the job now, to tell me something about the group d4, which is its domain. So how does it do that? Well, the first thing that we observe is that all those elements which are getting sent to 0, 0 being the additive identity in z mod 8, all those elements that are getting sent to 0 form a subset of d4, which turns out to be a subgroup. And not just a subgroup, but it turns out it will be a normal subgroup. And it's associated with this homomorphism phi by being the set of everything that phi sends to the identity. We call that the kernel of the homomorphism phi. The kernel is just the set of everything which is getting collapsed to the identity element by this homomorphism. The set of all elements of my domain such that phi of that element is equal to the identity element of the range, which in this case is 0. And it turns out, and this is the most important general principle number one, that for any homomorphism out of a group, the kernel of that homomorphism is always a normal subgroup of that group. And this is probably the most sophisticated way to find a normal subgroup out in the wild, is you hand me a group, I try to make a homomorphism out of that group into any other group that I like. And the kernel of that homomorphism will always be a normal subgroup in my original group, the domain. So we can use homomorphisms to find normal subgroups just by taking the kernel. And anytime I have a normal subgroup, I also have a factor group, the group that consists of the cosets of that normal subgroup inside of the larger group. In this example, the original normal subgroup here, the kernel of phi, happens to have index 2. And so the factor group consists of the two cosets, k and tk, for example, if that's how we want to represent them. So that's a group, this factor group is a group of order 2. Kind of think of that as the, the two rows of this, where the four columns are kind of corresponding to the elements of my original normal subgroup. So the factor group here is isomorphic to z mod 2, cyclic group of order 2. Meanwhile, the original normal subgroup, e, r, r squared, r cubed, that's a really nice subgroup. That's a cyclic subgroup. And its generator, for example, might be r. And so we can think of k here as being isomorphic to a cyclic group of order 4. And what we've accomplished here and we started out just by picking a homomorphism from d4 to some other group. But after we've done all this work, we've just realized d4 as a product of the subgroup z4 on the one hand and the factor group z2 on the other hand. We've realized d4 in a product construction with a subgroup d4, which happens to be normal, and its cosets, the factor group, that happen to be isomorphic to z mod 2. Now, z4 and z2 are both cyclic groups and therefore abelian. So we know for sure that d4 is not the direct product of those two groups. If it were the direct product, it would have to be abelian, because z4 and z2 are abelian. Since d4 is not an abelian group, we know it can't be on the nose 
a direct product. Uh, but yet the elements of D4 can still be written in unique ways as a product of some number of rotations with possibly one or zero reflections, T. And so it's still the internal direct product of these two subgroups, these two subgroups. Um, but since one of these subgroups isn't normal, we're not actually getting an abelian group out of this process. What we are getting is what we can call a semi-direct product of Z4 with Z2. Z4 is my normal subgroup. It's playing the role of my normal subgroup here. Uh, so we'll put a little normal subgroup symbol, but then we'll turn that into a little X that we've closed up to indicate that it's a semi-direct product. Um, that's just something you can get for free. Uh, we're not going to study semi-direct products in any more detail, but that's sort of the, the motivation for what we just did. Is we realized that D4 was a product of some kind of Z4 by Z2. But in fact, we can say even a little bit more. If we take a look at the image of this homomorphism inside of Z8, the image consists of everything which is equal to phi of something. And in this example, these elements are getting mapped to 0, these elements are getting mapped to 4, and so the image is the set that just consists of 0 and 4. But when you think about that set, 0 and 4, as a subset of Z mod 8, it's exactly a subgroup of Z mod 8 of order 2. And so this factor group, as the group of cosets of k inside of my original group, and the image of this homomorphism, which is these two integers taken with addition mod 8, those two groups behave exactly the same as one another. Those two groups are isomorphic. So that's one more really exciting thing that we got out of this process of defining a homomorphism out of D4 and into Z8. The homomorphism out of D4 has identified a normal subgroup inside of D4 that I can play with and on which we can build the subgroup, or build the whole group, D4. But over in Z8, the image of this homomorphism is a subgroup of Z8 in turn, and that image subgroup is isomorphic to the factor group of my original group by the kernel of this homomorphism. So that principle reads as follows. If I have any, any homomorphism at all from a group G to a group H, then if I take the factor group of G by the kernel of that homomorphism, G mod K, that would be this two cosets here, and if I take the image subgroup of that homomorphism inside of its target space, and in this case, that's 0 and 4 inside of Z mod 8, that there is an isomorphism between those two. That the image of this homomorphism tells me the isomorphism class of the quotient of the domain by the kernel. And that is a theorem that ties together everything that we've been talking about since we started talking about how to put groups together and take them apart. This is such an important theorem in abstract algebra that it gets the name of the first isomorphism theorem. It's the flavor of the first isomorphism theorem, attributed to Emmy Noether. And this is one of Noether's three isomorphism theorems that we're going to talk about in chapter 10. And this is the reason why we care about it so much, because from a single homomorphism out of a group, we get this bounty of information about normal subgroups and about factor groups associated just to that homomorphism that tell me something about the groups on which that homomorphism is acting. I can't wait to put those videos together for you in our next chapter.